Hi everyone, let's make this molecule. This is Dactylol, and it's a natural product. It's extracted from a sea hare that lives in the Caribbean. The name actually derives from the sea hare's formal species name, so it doesn't mean like finger alcohol or anything. I'm going to do a diastereoselective retrosynthesis of the racemic compound in this video. Okay, to get going, I'm going to identify some key features of this molecule. Functional group wise, I've got a tertiary alcohol here at the top. I have a Z configured alkene. I have an 8-5 fused ring system, and the ring fusion is trans. Now that already highlights one issue that we have to think about in our retrosynthesis. The trans ring fusion between a 5 and an 8 membered ring is probably not the most thermodynamically stable. For pretty much everything that's not a 6-6 ring fusion, the cis ring fusion is more thermodynamically favourable. If we disconnect near that ring junction, we might end up holding a group in a not particularly favourable arrangement. For example, if I disconnected the tertiary alcohol back to a ketone, and made a nucleophile at the end of the chain, it's being held on the top face, and it'd be trickier for that nucleophile to find the Bergy Dunnett's trajectory on the bottom face than it would be on the top face. So we're much more likely to form a cis ring fusion if we try to use this type of chemistry. Now we have another problem with this type of idea, in that formation of eight membered rings is quite tricky in itself, by any sort of additional substitution type mechanism. Say we have a nucleophile at one end of a ring, and a leaving group, just LG here, at the other end of the ring, Ring closure is observed to be slow for medium-sized rings. And by medium-sized, I mean things like seven-membered, eight-membered, maybe up to 12. And that's because if we have a large number of atoms in that ring, like here, all of those bonds can rotate around and give it lots of conformations. So the probability of being in a reactive conformation with perfect alignment for ring closure becomes increasingly less probable. Another major problem is that the transition state and the product are likely to have transannular strain that's where trying to accommodate all of those sp3 centers with tetrahedral bond angles leads to clashing across the ring. And even the best conformations that we can get that minimize that will probably have some eclipsing. So we can't fully stagger the system like we could in a six membered ring. So we need to be conscious of this and be careful how we go forwards. It basically means we're quite limited in what we can do with that eight membered ring. But luckily there's a handy reagent. I'm gonna target the Z-alkene first and disconnect across the CC double bond and that's because I want to do a ring closing metathesis reaction. This is often abbreviated to RCM. To break open that eight membered ring and use a transition metal catalyst, one that's really good at making rings of all sorts of different sizes. So what does the disconnection look like? Well, I'm just gonna put two green blobs on my structure just to keep track of very specific carbons here. These two carbon atoms are the green blobs in the product. So this disconnection allows me to break open the alkene to give me two smaller alkenes, but note that there's some extra CH2s here. I'll explain what happens to them in a second. So there's been a lot of optimization of catalysts that can do these alkene metathesis reactions. Probably one of the most easy to use ones is known as GRUBS2. It's got really good substrate scope and also isn't as moisture and air sensitive as some of the other catalysts that can do this reaction. Okay, so let's have a look at the structure of this catalyst. It's based on ruthenium. Now it looks a bit complicated, but I'll just explain what the bits are. We have a ruthenium center in the middle and it's trigonal bipyramidal have a couple of chloride ligands and an alkylidine ligand, which is a formal double bond between carbon and ruthenium. We have an N-heterocyclic carbene, or an NHC, in the axial position, which is just flanked by these aromatic groups. Those aromatic groups are just these trimethyl benzenes. This ligand is particularly good at stabilizing the ruthenium center throughout the mechanism for the metathesis reactions. And we also have a phosphine in the other axial position. And in this case, it's tricyclohexyl phosphine, so CYE is equal to cyclohexyl. This is very bulky. In fact, the whole thing is very bulky. But in the mechanism, we don't need to draw this out all the time. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to focus in on the business end of this compound, which is the alkylidine ligand with the ruthenium carbon double bond. And I'm just going to abbreviate the ruthenium structure with square brackets. That's just showing that I'm ignoring ligands for the rest of this. But I'm going to keep my carbon-carbon double bond and the phenyl substituent. So in the mechanism, I'm going to use that structure. So as an example, I'm just going to use a ring a bit like the one we've got in the retrosynthesis. I'm just going to say that there's any sort of number of carbons in here, just abbreviating with that bracket and the N there. And the N can easily be anything between 0 and about 15. That would be a metathesis forming a 20-membered ring in total. But that's only for lack of people trying. You, you can probably use this reaction to make bigger rings if you're careful with the reaction conditions. So the ruthenium catalyst will always go for the least hindered alkene if there's a choice. So here this monosubstituted alkene outcompetes the disubstituted one. And the productive reaction going forwards is a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition with the catalyst like this. Now this isn't a pericyclic reaction. There's a transition metal involved. 
So these curly arrows are being used a bit loosely here, not strictly on their formal definitions, but they help to guide the eye because when these two components come together, they form a metallocycle, in this case, a metallocyclobutane. Now this of course just forms reversibly because we could just draw the arrows going backwards like this and relieve the strain in that ring. But the point is there's an alternative that we can do and that's to break open the strain four membered ring in a slightly different way like this to make my substrate an actual ligand on the ruthenium center. Now that styrene molecule has just fallen off and it can float around in solution. It could get back involved with the catalyst again, but remember if we're using a catalytic amount of this ruthenium species, there's only a small amount of this anyway floating around. So I'm just gonna ignore it for the rest of this. And at this point, we start to see how the ring can form. We can now form an intramolecular metallocyclobutane by doing another two plus two reaction, something like this, again, reversibly, which can do the retro two plus two again on the opposite bonds to give me my ring closed product, which has an alkene in it. And also we regenerate a ruthenium alkylidine that's free to go and find another molecule. This time it doesn't have the phenyl group, it's just taking the CH2 off the molecule. But we notice that the pattern is still the same for this intermediate to be able to behave like the starting material over here. So we have catalysis with the ruthenium complex. I'll note that the next time we go around the cycle, we won't be spitting off the styrene here next time. On the future times around this cycle, we'll lose ethylene. And that's really good because that's a gas and we'll leave the reaction flask. That can help drive this reaction forwards. So this is an example of an incredibly useful catalytic cycle. And some of the researchers behind the development of this chemistry won the Nobel Prize in 2005, including Bob Grubbs, whom this particular catalyst is named after. Okay, so just going back to our retrosynthesis, we can now see that those two CH2s are going to combine together to form ethene, which is then lost to the surroundings. So in our disconnection, we actually had to add in those CH2s. But this will form the ring between those two green centers, absolutely no problem. And now we can just follow through with the retrosynthesis. We're no longer having to worry about making that medium-sized ring, so I can disconnect near that tertiary alcohol. Good ways of making tertiary alcohols are to use Grignard reagents, and it's more sensible for me to break at the branch point on the ring rather than inside the ring itself, so that I don't have to make the five-membered ring as well. That will take me back to the ketone, so I can quite simply just use a Grignard reagent here. The one I need will come from methyl bromide, which is cheap and readily available, and just treating that with magnesium. Now that Grignard will prefer to attack from below, and that's largely due to this adjacent stereo center here in the alpha position on this five-membered ring. I'll just draw the stereochemistry in fully here. We have a competition reaction between the top face of that ring having a CH2 and the bottom face just having a hydrogen. So this is a diastereoselective transformation where it's just easier to attack from below. This reaction is under kinetic control because the addition of a Grignard to form a CC bond is not reversible. So we'll get good selectivity for the easiest route. I'll just note that it doesn't actually matter what conformation that five-membered ring is in. The nearby presence of that group in the pseudo-equatorial or pseudo-axial position will still block the top face. This is common behavior for five-membered rings. Next, I've got an alpha alcohol substituent. These are easily installed using enolate chemistry. So I should be able to react this enolate with the alkyl halide and do SN2 there. It's a primary center, so that should be all right. The electrophile's a little bit blocked on its alpha substituent, so you might need to heat this up more than you'd expect, but it should be fine. Just to check the diastereoselectivity, let's just draw in the stereochemistry a bit more explicitly. So I've got a down methyl group and an up hydrogen near the reacting center. I'm just highlighting in orange there. This enolate is going to be pretty flat. All of this bit in yellow has to be coplanar, just based on the sp2 centers in the middle. So essentially what we've got is a top face that isn't very well hindered by that hydrogen and a back face that's more hindered by the methyl group. So in this case, we'll do SN2 on the top face, which will give us the stereochemistry that we want in the product. And this is another diastereoselective transformation. Now we have to be a bit careful about how we get that enolate in there. We could naively just say, well, let's just go back to the ketone, but we instantly run into a problem. We need to find a way for selecting one of those two hydrogens for enolization. And there's really not much chemical difference between the two sides if we had that particular ketone. So for example, using LDA to go backwards, which would be one of our usual tricks, won't work. But I think we can install the required enolate in a much more sneaky way if we're careful. In fact, we can install it at the same time as installing the methyl group. So I'm going to do another CC disconnection. And this time I'm going to use the cuprate to take me back to cyclopentenone, which is cheap and readily available. And what my plan would be to add, say, methyl magnesium bromide, but to make sure there's a copper one catalyst in there, say copper bromide. Alternatively, I could use another cuprate that I've made separately, such as this one. I guess it just depends on your own personal preference here. I think both would work fine. 
Now this cyclopentene is almost entirely flat. If we look at all those sp2 centers, they enforce all of those highlighted yellow carbons to be in the same plane as each other. So by default, the whole ring must be flat, maybe with a little bit of jiggling, but we don't need to worry about that. So I'm just going to draw a side on view here. When we add the cuprate, we get the product of what looks like conjugate addition, as in what the methyl nucleophile would look like if it adds in the beta position rather than directly at a carbonyl like you'd expect for just a normal magnesium grignard. And at this stage, there's no preference for top or bottom place because the molecule is planar. So the methyl group will add 50% of the time to the top face and 50% to the bottom face. So we'll get a racemic product from this particular reaction. But as we're heading towards a racemic final product, that doesn't matter for us here. Every other step along the way was diastereoselective, and we'll just get the reactions opposite to the bulky groups in those diastereoselective steps above. So if the methyl group adds to the bottom face, I'll just say that this is racemic. When we do our SN2 reaction, we'll get a preference to react from the top face because we're avoiding the bulk of that methyl group in preference to this much less bulky hydrogen. So as a result of this reaction, we'll get the antiproduct. The two substituents will be on opposite faces but we'll have a racemic mixture of the antidiasteroma, which is what we wanted in the first place. So what we're saying in our retrosynthesis is we're not going to isolate the enolate. So I'll just put some brackets around it for now, and we'll disconnect right back to the cyclopentenone. That just leaves the bromide left that we need to make for the SN2 reaction. That can be made from the alcohol. And then we could do a functional group into conversion to give us a useful functional group to handle. I'm going to use this ester because I know I could then use enolate chemistry to disconnect across here to give me my allyl group. And I could also go backwards just by reducing with lithium aluminium hydride. To make the bromide from the alcohol, I could just use something like PBR3. Okay, and final step, which will take me back to methyl isobutyrate, which probably smells pretty bad, but is definitely cheap and readily available. So I can go backwards by treating it with LDA at minus 78 degrees, and then treating the lithium enolate with allyl bromide. And then we're done. If you found the discussion useful, please do let me know your thoughts in the comments below and maybe drop the video a like and also subscribe to my channel if you want to see more videos like this.